Since the 1960s, we had open drug scenes in Oslo and in many other cities. And since the 80s, we started criminalizing much more, putting more and more people to jail, up to lifetime in prison for using and possessing drugs. Then we started to have very many drug overdoses. And it was when the HIV epidemic started in the 80s that we started harm reduction efforts. We hand out up to 5,000 syringes every day. And we have 8,000 people in substitution treatment. But we have still the open drug scenes. People are living in harshness. A lot of people are still dying. And all these drug-related deaths could be preventable. That's why we're fighting for a new drug policy. Now we're in the drug consumption room and that has been open in Oslo since 2005. Here they can inject in a safe and hygienic uh, environment. This place, it saves very many lives. One of our major aims is HIV and hepatitis prevention among drug users. We want to have uh, here a room for people to consume at a safe place without pressure. And we, here we have the possibility to address the people with um, safer use information. This is the injecting zone. It's got the capacity for 20 people to inject simultaneously. We've had over 6,000 separate individuals register to use the service, and there's almost 400,000 visits to the service in that time. More than 6,500 overdoses to, to the service, and everybody survived, everybody's walked out. For les urgences, les overdoses, les malaises, euh, les crises d'épilepsie, enfin voilà, on a deux possibilités. Soit on, on, on prend aussi pas mal en charge les gens ici et après on peut les transférer aux urgences de l'hôpital. Et si c'est une urgence absolue, enfin très grave, on a un recours euh, direct à, au service de réanimation qui se déplace et qui vient ici euh, en moins de cinq minutes. This is the place for injecting drugs. This is a place for sniffing. for sniffing. This is another area, a separate area for CISA smokers. We have the naloxone kit here. It's very easy, it's simple, it's safe. This is one of the most successful public health care projects in North America. Ultimately, the what six to seven hundred injections that take place every day at Insight, or, or more, uh, those are injections that aren't taking place in our alleys and on the street and whatever the case may be. When they can come to a facility where they're decently treated, where they're not judged, where they're not rejected, where they're accepted on the level that they exist on, there's much more of an opportunity for them to actually feel safe and relaxed and to open up uh, to the possibility of treatment. For a lot of people, they can't imagine that allowing people to use drugs and providing a place for people to use drugs actually helps people. Well, the truth is people get well when they feel better. And we give them hope by believing in them as human beings. It's not about saying it's okay or we're promoting you to use drugs. It's about the safety. And yeah, it's just saving lives. It's, it's a lot. Gives you a chance, right? At life. Drug consumption rooms are known by different names over time and space. Yet, they all meet the same. A safe space where people who use drugs can do so under hygienic conditions, with support, and without fear of violence or legal repercussions. Today, more than 140 legally sanctioned drug consumption rooms operate in 11 European countries, as well as in Australia, Canada, Mexico, and the USA. Join us on a global tour to discover why they were established, how they support the local communities, and how these life-saving harm reduction facilities have evolved over time. To begin, let's visit AMOC, one of the three DCRs run by my organization, the Regenboog Group in Amsterdam. In a drug consumption room in the Netherlands, it is legal to use drugs. We have, as you can see, a room with smokers and injectors. On the table with containers, it's purely for injection. On the tables without container, people can smoke. I personally think that the drug consumption room are extremely efficient ways to tackle many problems. There are three main goals. One is to reduce the public nuisance associated to drug use. One of the other goal is to limit the drug overdose death. 
And uh, the last one officially is to reduce the possibility of contamination HIV hepatitis C. Regarding the public nuisance, since the opening of the very first drug consumption room in the Netherlands, the associated drug public nuisance have almost disappeared. Before the establishment of drug consumption room, the HIV ratio within injectors in the Netherlands was between 12 and 18 percent. Right away after the opening of the drug consumption room, we dropped under 4 percent. We have never had a lethal overdose in any of the drug consumption room worldwide. We want that the clients access not only an hygienic place to use under supervision, but also a place where they can have a shower, change their clothes, uh, rest, sleep, drink water and eat food. We have various peer workers who are involved in the whole building. Drug consumption rooms adapt to the unique needs and dynamics of their communities, with goals that vary between cities and evolve over time. Initially established in Swiss, Dutch and German cities in the 80s and early 90s, the first legally sanctioned drug consumption rooms emerged as a vital component in reducing the harms associated with the heroin epidemic and HIV-AIDS prevention efforts. These early drug consumption rooms aim to bring a street-based heroin injection in open drug scenes closer to health and care services. Three decades later, the most prominent argument for supporting the expansion of drug consumption rooms in North America highlights the role as part of a comprehensive response to a synthetic opioid overdose crisis and toxic market supplies. The first legal supervised consumption site in North America, Inside, opened in 2003 in Vancouver's downtown Eastside. As you will see next, Inside is so much more than just a space for safer injecting. Insight has 800 to 1,000 visits every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Close to 30% of those visits are people inquiring about how can I get into detox, how can I get into on-site upstairs. The first time somebody comes, they register. I don't need you to use your real name. So right from the moment you come to Insight, it's all about relationships and one-on-one -on -one as much as we can. Pearl. Thank you. What are you using? Uh, heroin. All right. You have to come to Thank you. I have to get my stuff. When they walk through the door, they self-report what they're using. I'm using heroin, I'm using cocaine, I'm using crystal meth. That all gets recorded what time you came in. I want to get some harm reduction supplies and leave. I want to see a nurse about a wound I have. That goes into the database. Yeah, I need, I'm going to need someone to help me tie off, please. Then that person tells you what booth you will be at. You come here, you get your supplies, and then you go to your booth and you use. Filters, got everything. Go to my booth. There, cleanliness is so important. So you don't get an abscess. This is heroin. The staff here, nurses, non-nurses are available to help you find a vein, any information you need about safer practices. All those opportunities, when you need me to pass you another syringe, when you need some help finding a vein, those are all great opportunities for me and you to talk, for me to get to know you. Darwin, can you tie me? I'm not gonna do it too tight. No. And then you just pull yeah, it out. Yeah, 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 thank you. done. Somebody was saying, do people come to this site as a cry for help? And I thought to myself, no, actually, people come to this site because they want to use where it's clean, where it's well lit, and where it's warm. And if you build a relationship with them as they use this site, if you open yourself up to them, then they may cry for help to you. They may say, listen, known you for a few months, can you tell me about methadone, or detox upstairs, or housing, things like that. We're in a three-story building. The storefront or the street level is the injection site. 
The second floor is a detox center where people stay probably eight days, five to eight days. And then above that is what we call a transitional recovery program. So that's what the third floor is. I do well at the detox center, it's been eight days. I want to go on to recovery or I want to get better housing. So now I can go to the third floor and stay for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. Insight has really met all its primary objectives. It's improving public disorder, it's reducing the transmission of infectious diseases, it's reducing the morbidity and mortality associated with overdose, and it's connecting people to programs such as addiction treatment, and it's having no negative impacts. Insight is highly cost effective and uh, is uh, saving literally millions of dollars uh, since the time it's opened. Often they'll start talking about, well, they'll be dressing a wound or talking about detox, and then all of a sudden, bam, the, the, their, their feelings and their, their story comes out. I've never heard stories like this in my life. Grown men, like, in tears. Residential school abuse, childhood sexual abuse, violent abuse, homelessness as a child, serial abandonment, stuff that will curl your hair. Indeed, drug consumption rooms provide care and support to the best marginalized and underserved communities. Many visitors experience homelessness and lack access to health and social care. To reduce these barriers, many drug consumption rooms are located in urban areas, easily accessible through a low threshold harm reduction facility, providing access to a broad portfolio of care services. Where large capacities require, drug consumption rooms operate in a more specialized form within or near the communities they serve. Examples of these are the two DCRs in Australia, one in Sydney, opened in 2001, and the second one in Melbourne, which was opened in 2018. The injecting room, if they want access, they'll go through there, but they can just come in and access regular needle and syringe services or access the consulting site. We've had over 6,000 separate individuals register to use the service, and there's almost 400,000 visits to the service in that time. At the moment, we have about 300 visits to the service a day. On average, we've had up to 450 visits in a single day, which okay. makes, makes it one of the busiest injecting rooms in the world. People come here because they feel safe. Yeah. They know they don't get judged, and they know that if anything goes wrong, then they're in safe hands, and someone's going to be there to catch them if they fall. More than 6,500 overdoses to to the service and everybody survived, everybody's walked out. This is the injecting zone. It's got the capacity for 20 people to inject simultaneously. I really like this room because I, I know I'll come out and I can safely use whatever my substance of choice is on the day. I just feel safe here. I know that I'm not gonna die in the alleyway. It's called a vein finder. It kind of can show up the, the veins more easily. Well, I think this is probably our most informal area and it's also the place we really get to build up relationship and rapport with people. We can actually do a lot of our referral work, our psychosocial work and also engaging with people to check in on how they are. So you can get a very quick rapid result within 60 minutes for hepatitis C RNA, so indicating current hepatitis C infection. You can obviously get treatment prescribed very quickly and then clients started on treatment very quickly as well. We have a range of services from primary care, legal support, drug treatment, uh, wound care, sexually transmitted infections, mental health support. Uh, more than 800 people have started the opiate pharmacotherapy and more than 300 people started uh, hepatitis treatment. We managed to provide oral health services to more than 100 prior to COVID as well. The police uh, do have their protocols for how they allow the centre to operate. So there is specific legislation saying that within this building, drug possession and and, and other drug-related crimes are different to the rest of the community. So less than three grams, which is less than a trafficable quantity, is not a crime to be in possession of in this building here. However, outside it remains a crime. It's still a crime outside and the police can arrest people, but generally speaking, they allow people to come into the facility. To see the you know, holistic range of services you have here, uh, supporting the most vulnerable in the community is really heartwarming. And to think that it's all paid for by the public purse is, is particularly uh, encouraging. And clearly there's a need for much more of it, uh, not only in this city and state, but across Australia. My own country has nothing like this. There are cases when instead of a fixed site, the drug consumption room is operated from a van. 
Mobile truck and sensor rooms are flexible solutions, particularly rich in remote community areas. However, they also have the limitations due, for example, the small size. In our next stop, we visit one such bus operating by Fixmoon in Berlin. Currently, they run the services with two vans at the same time, one for the truck and sensor room and the other one for counseling and other services. Zwei Löffel, zweimal Folie, Wasser, zweimal äh, Salz. Salz. Super. Guck mal nochmal schnell rein. Alles drin. Perfekt. Vielen Dank. Mach's gut. Schönen Tag. Tschüss. We see here a table, a seat. Um, here people can, um, can sit down and take the drugs. Um, at first I have to wash their hands to show what they want to, con want to take, what drug they have to show us. Um, they, it's forbidden to share the drugs. So they have to, to use their own drugs. We have a lot of stuff here. We have uh, needles, we have water. And here we have tiny, yeah, prepared yeah, kids. kids. On different places in the city, you have uh, the people prefer other substance. On one location, more heroin. On the other location, more cocaine. And the crack use increased over the last five, six years. And uh, it's a new phenomenon in Berlin. In the future, we hope we can provide a smoking a possibility for, for crack users and for heroin users who want to, to smoke and don't inject. Hast du Blut an uh, Händen? Der kann sich hier dann auch die Hände desinfizieren, ja? Guck mal. Here are social worker, peers, and in this van are nurses or medical staff. And so we are working together. Haben wir, haben wir Unterhose, weißt du das? Ja, haben wir. Haben wir? Willst du mal rübergehen? Meine Kollegin ähm, berät dich dann da, ja? Do you have any problems with the police? We have another view on the people uh, than the police. There are conflicts, of course, but we try to manage the conflicts. We, we gave no names, no data to the police. And with the people who are living in a uh, non-drug user neighborhood? Yeah, it's, it depends where you are. So we, in Köln we have no, no huge problems, but um, the people there have problems with needles in the parks. It's not the main goal to re reduce the open drug scene in the public. Of course, it's, it's one aim, but we, at first we are a healthcare service. We want that the people are healthy and that they don't infect it with HIV and hepatitis. Yeah. We want to save lives. Although one of the aims of a drug consumption room might be to reduce public nuisance, the opening of a room can evoke fears of local citizens that it will attract more users to the area. To tackle these fears and foster a good relationship with the locals, it is common for drug consumption rooms to establish committees with neighbors, the police or other stakeholders. Next, we visit Kaya, the drug consumption room in France and a good example of the positive outcome of active collaboration with local communities. Avant la salle, enfin depuis 2005, il y avait euh, donc cette scène de consommation. Alors ça se passait dans les toilettes publiques, dans les halls d'immeubles, sur les trottoirs. Il y avait oui, des rassemblements de 30, 40 usagers assez régulièrement et, et des consommations de rue très importantes qui ont diminué beaucoup avec euh, l'ouverture de la salle. L'enquête de l'Inserm qui a été menée euh, depuis le démarrage du projet, enfin même un peu avant, a montré euh, plusieurs points importants, une réduction des pratiques à risque de 11%, une réduction du recours aux urgences pour 26%, une réduction des actes délictueux pour 20%. Donc ils, ils ont montré aussi euh, bah, une diminution des overdoses de 2%, mais c'est vrai que nous on n'a pas tellement d'overdoses euh, euh, comparativement à d'autres pays. Donc on voit l'accès aux soins qui est facilité, euh, ne serait-ce que pour accéder au traitement hépatite C ou au traitement de substitution. Mm -hmm. Sur l'environnement, euh, on a une réduction de, de trois fois, euh, des, une réduction, euh, les seringues usagées, enfin le matériel usagé a été diminué par euh, trois. Moi j'habite, euh, mes fenêtres donnent sur la, sur la salle, oui. euh, je suis à, à l'angle euh, patin, euh, rugby patin, Ambroise Paré, euh, Magenta, donc, mm -hmm. euh, donc je vois la, la salle. Vraiment ce que ça a amélioré, c'est que ça a fait disparaître ces scènes d'injection. Mm -hmm que maintenant on peut retourner au square Cavalier École, euh, qui est au square de l'école, euh, qui est euh, redevenu un square où on peut aller avec des enfants, on peut aller jouer avec des enfants, on a beaucoup moins de seringues. 
ça n'a pas tout amélioré, euh, puisqu'il y a quand même encore des scènes d'injection, on les voit euh, euh, dans la rue, mais ça a rétréci de toute façon déjà le périmètre des, des, des mmh. quelques rues. Euh, on est vraiment sur deux rues où, où, où se, se retrouvent ces scènes euh, d'injection. Despite the success and impact of French drug consumption rooms like Gaia and Strasbourg, and the advocacy efforts by organizations such as the French user organization ASUT, no new drug consumption room have opened in France since 2016. New rooms are urgently needed to address the needs of crack smokers in the country. France is not alone in this struggle. In many cities, establishing these services can take years, sparking controversy and facing multiple barriers. Therefore, long-term political support is crucial for the establishment and sustainability of drug consumption rooms. Our next stop, the drug consumption room in Athens, Greece, is a great example of this. Okana, the main harm reduction service provider in Greece, opened a pilot this year in downtown Athens in 2013. Within less than a year, the room had to shut down due to a sudden order from the prosecutor. Eight years later, thanks to a strong political support, they managed to open a drug consumption room again. We have a DCR, the first DCR in southeastern Europe. All this support came with very, very good and great political support meaning that we had the first citizen of the country, the president of the Hellenic Republic, who came and inaugurated the DCR. We have the support of the prime minister. The prime minister paid a visit to the DCR and it was a political commitment of his party to create a, a DCR, which is not also easy for a conservative party to have this so liberal option as political, let's say, commitment. This is the place for rejecting drugs. This is the place to... for sniffing. For sniffing. This is another area, a separate area for CISA smokers. Yes, it's closed. Yeah. There is a special uh, fun. Uh, yes, here. to clean the air. We have the, the safeguard for the pipe for the mouth, okay, so that they are safe when they use this. Perimen. Αυτό είμαστε ταξί. Προσέχεις. Yeah. How is the relationship with the neighborhood? Uh, actually, it's very good because prior to opening, I used to have visits and really sensitize them towards what we're going to do. They were really afraid, oh, you're going to gather all these people, we're going to have problems outside and so on. And I said, no, that's, that's the opposite. When we open, nobody's going to stay outside. Whenever there is a problem, they give me a call because then they know me personally, the whole neighborhood. And things have changed, uh, have bettered for them. How is the relationship with police? Police are actually, the, the ones who are nearby, they're very close to us. Before starting this century, we managed to, set, to visit them and uh, explain and get some sensitivity out of them. And they really support us. They send people here. Whenever they have someone, a drug user that they know that belongs to us, they give us a call and we go to the uh, police department and we take care of the whatever issue there is. So we're on good grounds. We're doing it together. That's the thing, with the neighbors, with the police, with, we try to do it together. And with drug users who are not here members of this center. We try to relate. That's the, the, the magic word. We have the relationship with them. Even in cases which adverse legal and policy frameworks exist, successful examples of drug consumption rules implementation exist based on local consensus, effective communication, and community organizing. Examples of this are the drug consumption room in Liège, which opened his doors despite the lack of a legal framework, or inside, which the government at the time threatened to shut down, fighting their way up to the Canadian Supreme Court to keep it open. Okay, everybody, we won! In Toronto, community members and frontline workers open up unsanctioned overdose prevention sites as an immediate and direct response to the overdose epidemic. One of the biggest things drug user activists are known for in Toronto in the last years is the opening of the illegal injection site in Moss Park, where we've been in this overdose crisis for many years now and just watching our friends and family and loved ones and co-workers and co-organizers die 
And instead of waiting for sites, supervised consumption sites to open, we went ahead and opened one ourselves. This is a tent that has been erected here in Moss Park. Inside, 140 naloxone kits to be used against opioid overdoses. Unfortunately, there's some bylaws that are going to be broken. We know. There. We know what we're doing, um, and uh, and we just want to help save people's lives. We just don't want to go to memorials, funerals anymore. We don't want to see more dead people. Civil disobedience act like this have changed the landscape of many country drug policies not only in Canada, but also in Denmark and others, and have contributed to drug consumption rooms becoming legal. Communities of people who use drugs have not only been a driving force in advocating for drug consumption rooms, they also have a crucial role in the operation of these services. Our next stop will be at the DCR Imura area, Lisbon, which is a good example of a peer-run service. Imuraria is not an official DCR drug consumption room. So we created uh, this space because people were smoking and injecting in the streets. People come here, to, they knock on, in, on this door to have access to a safe space to, to use drugs, managed and leaded by our peers, João, Rosario, the other peer, and Jacinto. Together we designed and painted this uh, graffiti with some very important messages for our, from our community. We built this, pl uh, this place because of an European project. It was a project on uh, education for safer consumption. This room, it's an informal room. Okay, so CICAD is aware of it, they visited it uh, quite often. MCDDA comes here all the time and we are in the process of certifying the place. The community also wants to define the rules and how the service works, so we have to be very attentive about it. When In Moreria opened, uh, we thought we would get mostly injectors, but it was not the case, so we had a lot of people using crack. So what the colleagues did, they implemented the pilot to see what kind of pipe they would prefer to use. We had these three places here, two there, and the original idea was that this was a, a, the nurse uh, office, now it's uh, also for consumption, uh, and what we uh, realized that sometimes, yeah, for example, for women uh, wanting to inject drugs, sometimes it was not comfortable to be in the same space. And because sometimes they want to inject in other parts of the body that it's more intimate, they can go there and close the door and they are more comfortable. But there's always so the peers, uh, uh, they manage the, this space, but of course there's always a nurse here at the same time if they, she needs to to provide uh, care to someone. Violence is not accepted here, racism and uh, violence against women. We don't want to create a medicalized space. It's not, I'm not against medicalized space. I just believe that in a, in a city, in a territory, there should be different kinds of models and different kinds of interventions. Rosario, our peer, she's the one who usually leads also the, uh, the injection Part, and uh, the injection uh, spot is a very intimate space. We have a curtain here and people, while they are preparing the substance and injecting, they, they are sharing uh, so many things and uh, it's a very special moment uh, of the day. And then the peers and the harm reduction workers who do the community intervention are the ones who sometimes take people if they want to. They make the bridge with the social worker, the nurses or the doctors. Since their opening, drug consumption rooms have continuously innovated to adapt to different substances, patterns of consumption and to increase the safety of the local communities. In recent years, for example, drug consumption rooms such as On Point in New York or KNA in Zurich now provide on site drug testing. Also, many drug consumption rooms have implemented new models of care to increase access to the service by communities that up until now experience various success in them, such as women and gender diverse people or migrants who use drugs. In these cases, we see how drug consumption rooms provide not only healthcare, but also respond to broader structural issues, such as housing exclusion, gender-based violence, as well as marginalization, stigma, and discrimination. Such services are, for example, Regatza in Hamburg, Sister Space in Vancouver, and Medicineres in Barcelona, which will be our last visit in this film as well. Medicineres, que es una cooperativa que tiene como propósito 
eh, generar espacios de cobijo para mujeres y personas de género fluido que sobreviviendo a múltiples situaciones de violencia y vulnerabilidad y atravesadas por la guerra contra las drogas. Todo esto surge un poco de, de, a raíz de una investigación donde no solamente nos damos cuenta de que no existen datos sobre mujeres y personas de género no binario que usan drogas, sino que además eh, existe un, un gran vacío en cuanto a los servicios y el acompañamiento que pueden recibir esas personas. ¿no? Por una parte lo que nos encontramos es que eh, las mujeres y personas de género no binario o bien no llegan o bien no se adhieren a unos servicios que son especialmente androcéntricos, entonces están más pensados para ellos y, no solo, y a veces no, no representan lugares seguros. Eh, y aparte, pues no atienden sus especificidades. ¿no? Por otra parte, cuando se dirigen a servicios para mujeres o para personas de género no binario, lo que se encuentran es que son excluidas por el hecho de, de utilizar sustancias psicoactivas. Tenemos espacios donde ellas pueden inyectarse, pueden fumar, pueden esnifar, incluso aquellas que beben alcohol, siempre con el acompañamiento del equipo. ¿Y qué? ¿Cómo nos va la vida? Pues bien, cariño, con mucho cansancio, porque he estado toda la noche trabajando. Oh, bueno, eso es bueno, ¿no? Y bueno. Bien, ¿te han pagado todos? Por supuesto, me voy a hacer de oro. <risa> Muy bien. Ay, gracias, Raquel. De nada, con ahí. Vale. Que además contamos con el apoyo de comunicadoras, de talleristas, que nos permite tener una muy rica agenda de actividades, eh, eso, artísticas, creativas, terapéuticas y un poco de todo a la vez. Eh, desde fotografía, teatro, ilustración. Eh, cosmética natural, para precisamente brindar ese, esas herramientas para la autogestión y para el, el empoderamiento ¿no? de, de todas las que acabamos formando parte de, de Medineras. Muy bien. Viendo que, que el consumo no está en el centro, sino que es una consecuencia más de, de las múltiples situaciones o una forma más que tienen las mujeres y, y las personas de género no binario de enfrentar y de encararse a las múltiples situaciones de, de exclusión y de justicia social ¿no? a las que tienen que hacer frente. Pues lo que hemos querido ha sido eso, crear un espacio seguro, tranquilo, en el que poder caminar desde la solidaridad y el apoyo mutuo eh, y buscábamos eso, ¿no? sacar precisamente el hecho de incorporar el consumo uh, como una parte de las necesidades de estas mujeres también hace que el consumo deje de ser la principal barrera para, para poder desarrollar, desarrollarse a ellas mismas. ¿no? Veíamos que el hecho de consumir era la principal barrera, el principal estigma ¿no? y que desde el momento en que el consumo no se pone en el centro como barrera tampoco eh, deja de ser tan importante. ¿no? no estamos hablando del consumo, estamos hablando de vivienda, estamos hablando de trabajo, estamos hablando de salud emocional, física, um, psicológica, estamos hablando de tener un grupo de amigas y de acabar con la soledad, ¿no? que también es una de las grandes razones que hace que las mujeres uh, acaben Um, teniendo problemas relacionados con las drogas, que no es tanto con las drogas, sino con, con eso, ¿no? con la soledad, con el miedo, con el frío, ¿no? con, con el aislamiento. Entonces lo que intentamos es crear eso, ¿no? un espacio de cobijo donde, donde podemos crear eso, ¿no? una, una familia. <risa>